In this lab, we're going to look at two different enzymes and how those enzymes work. We're going to start first by looking at the enzyme catalase. And the catalase that you're going to be observing or working with is catalase that was taken from potato cells. Now, all cells make catalase, so we could have taken catalase from human cells, for example, but for the ease of working in the lab and for experimentation, um, our model organism today is going to be the potato. Now, what catalase does is it breaks down hydrogen peroxide into water and oxygen. So again, if we think about this, from the previous video, we know that we can identify our enzyme by observing that ending ASE, right? So here's our enzyme catalase and the reactants, or in this case, the specific substrate that should interact with the catalase is hydrogen peroxide, the H2O2. The products that we expect are water and oxygen. And the oxygen bubbles are actually, we are going to be able to observe those and we're going to be able to measure those. Now, just to tell you a little bit more, uh, give you a little bit more background in regards to this reaction, hydrogen peroxide is sort of a naturally produced byproduct of different chemical reactions that happen in our cells. Um, it can be very, very toxic to living cells. And so all cells, again, whether it's a potato or whether it's your and my cells, create or produce the enzyme catalase. And what that catalase can do is it converts that har harmful hydrogen peroxide into water and oxygen. So in the lab, what we typically are doing is we're looking at the oxygen production, okay, oxygen gas production, um, which is visible as sort of little foamy bubbles, and we're able to measure those and use those as an indication that the chemical reaction has occurred. And we can use that actually to even measure the activity level of the catalase. So the first four procedures that you're going to do are going to really work with this enzyme catalase. The first procedure, 5.1, is really going to address um, a topic that we covered in the first video, and that's this idea that each enzyme has a specificity. It sort of acts like a lock that really should interact with one substrate potentially. And so if you remember back to that first video, we said that where the substrate interacts with the enzyme is called the active site. And the active site is sort of like that lock and the substrate is sort of like the key that fits into that lock. Now, if this is the case, then for every enzyme, right, we really should only expect activity if we put that enzyme in the presence of its proper substrate. So, so in procedure 5.1, we're really testing that enzyme substrate specificity. So you can see that we're going to have, we're going to put our enzyme catalase with water in one test tube, hydrogen peroxide in a second test tube, glucose solution in the third, and a protein solution in the fourth. And then what we're going to do is we're going to observe the oxygen gas that's produced in the form of sort of these little oxygen bubbles. And we're going to measure that. In regards to explanation, really what we're looking for here is, did you get a reaction? right? Did the catalase react with, for example, the water or the hydrogen peroxide or the glucose solution, the protein solution? And we're able to, to, to determine that based on if any oxygen bubbles were produced when combined with the enzyme catalase. So that's really what you'll be doing in that first procedure. In procedure 5.2, 5.3, we're really looking at the optimals for the enzyme catalase. So remember that the catalase that you're looking at was taken from a potato, okay? So this is not taken from an organism that maintains its own temperature, right? This is not taken from you in regards to anything taken from your blood which is a pH of 7.4, right? So sometimes what happens here is that we make predictions based on, or hypotheses based on sort of what would happen in us. But keep in mind that your model organism is a potato, all right? So their temperature optimals, their pH optimals may be quite different from yours and mine. And so what in procedure 5.2 you're going to end up doing 
is you are going to go ahead and put your enzyme catalase at three different temperatures. So you're going to have it at a very cool temperature. Um, usually it's around anywhere from four to 10 degrees Celsius. You're going to have it in an incubator and the incubator temperatures are usually around uh, 42 degrees Celsius. And then you're going to put your catalase, your enzyme in a boiling water bath, which is a hundred degrees Celsius plus. So very, very hot. After your um, catalase sits at these different temperatures, and again, these are going to be three separate test tubes, what you're going to end up doing is you are going to, after 15 minutes, remove those test tubes from those specific temperatures, and you are going to add your hydrogen peroxide, you're going to swirl it a little bit, and you are going to go ahead and record the bubble height. Again, that bubble height represents the amount of oxygen in, in regards to the product that's formed at these different temperatures. Once you've got that the oxygen measurements recorded, you can draw your conclusions. Again, the idea here is if you have no oxygen produced, right, then the catalase was not active at that temperature. And so we're really looking to see at which temperature is the catalase most active active. And again, we can draw conclusions from that in regards to, is it an endothermic organism, one that generates its own body heat, or is it not? What does that mean? Would it be the same as yours and mine? So we don't only want you just to analyze your results, but we also want you to use those results and, and, and be able to interpret them and tell us what they mean. Now, in procedure 5.3, we're going to examine the um, sort of pH optimal for the enzyme catalase. So different uh, conditions can cause proteins to denature, right? So if we put the enzyme at the wrong, at a, at a temperature that's not optimal, or in this case, a pH that's not optimal, it can influence the bonds. And it can also um, affect sort of a, attractions between different um, ions. And so there's a lot of things that can sort of happen when you put an enzyme or really any molecule in a pH that is outside of their optimal. Um, <clears throat> now, in this case, what we are going to do is we are going to, again, have three different test tubes and we are going to take our catalase and we are going to put it with water that's already been pH'd for you. So we're going to put your catalase with an acidic pH water Okay, or a solution that has an as it is acidic in nature, so a pH of three. We're going to take your catalase and combine it with a solution that has a neutral pH, and we're going to take your catalase and we're going to put it with a um, solution that has been adjusted for a basic pH. Again, what we want to do is we want to swirl it so we get a good mix. And then what we're going to do is we're going to then add the hydrogen peroxide, the substrate to each of those test tubes. And we're going to observe where do we see oxygen bubbles generated? Okay, does it work best in an acidic pH, a more neutral pH, or a basic pH? And again, we're going to be able to sort of determine that Okay, in regards to writing our explanation by looking at the bubble height. Again, if the, the test tube that produces the most bubble bubbles, oxygen bubbles, is the more optimal environment for our um, catalase enzyme. And again, just keep in mind that model organism here is the potato, right? And so different organisms have different optimals, okay, different um, sort of conditions under which they are going to work the best. Now, the last procedure that we're going to um, use the enzyme catalase is procedure 5.4. And here, we're going to look at the effect of concentration on the activity of our enzyme catalase. Now, one of the things that uh, we want students to understand is that enzymes are not used up in the chemical reactions, okay? They are, um, they can be reused over and over and over. So what that means is a small amount of enzymes um, can can eventually convert a large amount of substrate into um, product. I like to think of this almost like pots and pans that you use in your kitchen, right? You can reuse those pots and pans over and over and over. Um, you don't necessarily, every time you use a pot, have to go out and buy a new one or a pan, go out and buy a new one. Enzymes are very similar, right? They can be used 
over and over. And so a few pots and pans, just like a little bit of enzyme can go a real far away. So in this experiment, we're going to start with different amounts of the enzyme catalase. So we're going to start with a centimeter here. Um, one centimeter is approximately equivalent to one milliliter. So really, we're going to have a milliliter of um, catalase in the first test tube, two milliliters of catalase in the second, and three milliliters of catalase in the third. And then we're going to put a consistent amount of hydrogen peroxide, approximately three mils of hydrogen peroxide in each of these test tubes. And then after 20 seconds, we're going to measure the bubble height. Again, expecting or again, predicting sort of what should happen, right? The more enzyme that we have, again, the faster the reaction, right? The quicker, um, not the quicker, but the more active sites that are available to interact with our with our reactant. And so we really expect that we should get more product, more of those oxygen bubbles. So again, you're going to be watching the videos or carrying out the experiments, and you're going to be able to get an idea of how many oxygen bubbles are produced if you use one mil versus two mils versus three mils of our, um, of our enzyme, of our catalase. Now, the last experiment that you're going to do in the enzyme lab um, is going to involve a different enzyme. In this experiment, you are going to use the enzyme salivary amylase. And again, note that the enzyme ends in ASE, right? One way that we can help ourselves identify which is the enzyme. Salivary amylase is, as the name maybe gives away, is produced in your salivary glands. And what it is used to do is it can take the reactant starch, which again, remember, is a polysaccharide. It's a big carbohydrate. And it can do a hydrolysis reaction and break that starch into smaller reducing sugars like glucose and maltose. So if you think back to the biologically important molecules lab, you use two different colorimetric tests to detect starch or reducing sugars. So remember to detect the reducing sugars, you use the Benedict's test. To detect starch, you use the iodine test. So you will want to go back and review those colorimetric tests. Remember with the Benedict's test, blue indicated a negative result. Red, reddish orange, yellow green indicated a positive result. For the iodine test, sort of this amber color that you're seeing here represented a negative result. And the bluish color, the bluish sort of blackish purplish color indicated a positive that starch was present. We are going to use those colorimetric tests in procedure 5.5 to, to determine whether the salivary amylase is actually converting starch, the substrate, into the products glucose and maltose. So in this experiment, what students are going to be doing is they're going to have six different test tubes. And we're going to have various controls, so be aware of that. The first two test tubes, what we want to see is when we put iodine with water or Benedict's with water, what happens, right? And again, if you review back and think about what you did in the biologically important molecules lab, remember you used water as your negative control. And so you already, before you even do the experiment, you may be able to predict what the observed color would be. And again, the explanation is presence or absence of these macromolecules, right? So when we take water and we put it with iodine, that's a negative result, right? There's no starch present. When we take water and we put it with Benedict's, we expect sort of that light blue color. Again, the idea here is that there is no reducing sugars. So we should be able in some of these test tubes to already begin to jot down what we expect to happen. Test tubes three and four, we're going to just have starch and water. So again, these te test tubes one and two have the same um, sort of starting contents with the water. Test tubes three and four also have the same starting contents. They, they start with starch and water. Then we're going to test the starch and water with the iodine, and we're going to test in test tube four the starch and water with the Benedict's and see what happens. Again, you may be able to predict, based on what you did in lab four, what we expect the observed color to be. Or you can go back and you can actually look at the results that you obtained from the BIM lab. And again, you can sort of figure out what the observed color is and what the explanation is. It's really in test tubes five and six that we're 
especially curious what's going to happen because it's in t test tubes five and six that we're actually going to put the starch, the substrate, with the enzyme salivary amylase. We're going to let it sit so that the amylase has a chance to interact with the starch and so that that chemical reaction can happen. And then what we're going to do is after 10 minutes, we're going to test again with the iodine in test tube five and with the Benedict's in test tube six. And we're going to observe those colors in order to determine sort of what's happening in regards to those test tubes. Now, remember that with the Benedict's, you must heat that in order to get the reaction to occur to get the Benedict's um, to the Benedict's reaction um, to actually happen the way that it needs to. Iodine does not need to be heated. Okay, we do not want to heat iodine. Only the Benedict's. Once the experiment is done, right? All of this table should be completely filled in, and you should be able to answer the remaining questions that are. Um, associated with procedure 5.5.